they asked for volunteers for a secret mission. And we were eager, and we knew that uh, there was danger. The Japanese had already uh, infiltrated Burma. Once the rain started, well, I was a sea of mud from then on. I don't think it'll ever be duplicated again. Years before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, the war in the Pacific really began with the Japanese invasion of China in 1937. That Japanese aggression was little noted by the Western world, which was preoccupied with turmoil in Europe that grew into full-scale conflict upon the German invasion of Poland in 1939. While the West watched and tried to avert further German aggression, the Japanese Empire cast its hungry eyes on the European colonies in Asia. Those holdings were rich in natural resources. Their capture would contribute to the Japanese war effort and deny their use by eventual Western adversaries. It was to our strategic advantage to keep them there so that they wouldn't be helping their troops on the islands. In late 1943, Wingate had an opportunity to share his ideas with Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt. The U.S. President responded enthusiastically to Churchill's request for air support for the Chindits. Organized in secret as Project 9, about 500 U.S. airmen were deployed to India. This deployment was essentially a miniature version of a complete air force of fighter planes, light bombers, and cargo aircraft. There were also light observation aircraft, troop gliders, and medical evacuation aircraft, including four prototype helicopters requisitioned from testing duty. We started out being project number nine, and that's all we were, a special group going out on a special project. was a senior in high school, and uh, when war was declared, uh, of course I was like everybody else, I couldn't wait to enlist. I was originally commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Corps of Engineers uh, as an ROTC student from Louisiana State University in uh, June 1st, 1942. And, uh, uh, Near the end of 42, while I was on active duty with the Corps of Engineers, I volunteered for pilot training and, uh, and became a fighter pilot. I graduated from Cali. Uh, each one of us were commissioned in the reserve. And uh, in my case, I was sent to the 17th Bomb Group at uh, Port Hamilton, Oregon. I'll tell you, old was 25. Uh, I was, uh, let's see, uh, I was 23 at the time. And uh, my, my good friend Joe was uh, 21, 22. Uh, that was probably, he was probably the youngest pilot in the group. I was chosen. Uh, is one of the original 523 members that made up the group originally. And uh, I felt honored to be in that group of people. We had some strange guys in the place. We had one guy that was completely deaf in his left ear. His right ear was good. And we asked him, well, how did you get through a classification, you know? He said, easy. You went up, the doctor uh, uh, gave you a number in one ear, and you, you repeat it. He said, do a 180. We just, they just did a 360-degree turn. And got another number. They called it up and went in. People are eager to, eager to get into the service. 
Wingate was dispatched to Burma in 1942. His unconventional habits and unconventional tactics proved well suited to an unconventional theater of operations. Project 9 was soon renamed the 1st Air Commando Group. Well, there were several reasons why, uh, why uh, the 1st Air Commando Group was, was formed. Uh, one, uh, the, the, the Japanese had uh, some eight to ten divisions of troops in Burma and in China and it was to the advantage of, it was, it was to our uh, strategic advantage to keep them there so that they wouldn't be uh, helping their troops on the islands. We did have Japanese Zero type airplanes that were searching for us because uh, uh, they would like to have found our field and and striped, strafed us and wiped us out if possible, but somehow the communication systems were in the line somewhere. We got word if a Japanese squadron was flying in our direction, we were warned. We had a very sophisticated warning system. We had a tall bamboo pole set up with three big round uh, balls, uh, similar to basketballs or a little larger, and our instructions were if if one ball went up on that pole and everybody kept their eye on that pole in the center, center of the area there, we were to be alerted for a, a air raid. It would come down from the, usually come down from the British and they'd say they had a target. And fortunately we felt free to do anything we needed to do to complete the mission. It wasn't a stereotype mission at all. That was one good thing about it. Like in a regular bomb outfit, you take off and climb up, fly to your target and come home. But this was much more interesting, a little level all the time. In my experience, uh, I think we saw one Japanese aircraft uh, and that was about it. Now, we were usually in and out and out of the area before they could even get an airplane up. Jindit tactics were even adopted by Merrill's marauders attacking the Japanese from China. However, conventional supply techniques, transportation, and medical evacuation could not keep up with the Jindit long-range penetration missions. Jindit casualties were high and morale suffered along with combat effectiveness. First Air Commando operated under austere conditions, including Spartan facilities, muddy dirt runways, and bad weather in a far off corner of the war and almost at the tail end of a long supply chain. We uh, had a rougher experience with the air base that we were based at than I expected because when we transferred to from Karachi where we had reassembled our aircraft off of the aircraft carrier and was sent up to uh, Halakandi along the Burma border on the India side of the Burma border it was not an airport it wasn't a air base it was just a dirt field cleared out of uh, some uh, leveled off rice paddies and jungle trees all around us uh, and uh, we used the biggest part of the area as a runway for the airplane and the planes were based and we parked them back up into the trees to keep them as far out of sight as possible. And we had no facilities. Uh, we did have a few bamba bamboo built bashes that we uh, had for quarters and uh, we had no tower, we had no facilities uh, like an airport you'd think, just a dirt field and uh, uh, no tool, uh, we had toolboxes, we put those back in the trees and kept our 
30 caliber carbines alongside our toolbox and a 45 caliber pistol, which we had assigned to us. We kept that nearby because we were told we could be ambushed. My crew chief, uh, I got so you walk out the aircraft and he said if it was ready to fly, why well, we just crawled in. We never made a flight check like they do today. We, we just crawled in and took off. If he said it was all right, we trusted him. <laughs> Filling it with gasoline was a real chore because we did not have big tank trucks there or anything. Our gasoline was a 100 octane gasoline and our planes used a lot of it. And it came in 55 gallon drums and the transport aircraft would bring them in to us and roll them out on the ground and then we had to roll them over to our airplanes, stand them on the end and put the pump in the hole and start pumping. And uh, it took a lot of gas. A, a mission would take on a P-51, between five and six drums of gasoline to fill it after a long mission. And that's a lot of pumping, and that was hard. But uh, the rest of it was routine maintenance, which we were equipped to do and, and taught to do, and we did it very, very faithfully and thoroughly, knowing that when those planes went out, the life of that pilot was in balance and so was the airplane and it and it was our chore to keep that plane running there and back unless of course it got hit and damaged and something else took over our living quarters uh, would be a, a room about uh, maybe 15 by 25 feet uh, and the building was made of bamboo split bamboo. Uh, the floor was, uh, was uh, made of a lattice work of, of split bamboo. In spite of the challenges, the men of 1st Air Commando were able to maintain their aircraft, get the Chindits into battle, provide combat air support, supply the Chindits, and bring out the wounded. In the process, they earned the respect of the British troops. To get to the targets from where we were, we had to fly over the, what they call the uh, Chin Hills. And they were like 8,000 feet mountains, right? Uh, the problem, of course, was coming home a lot of times during the monsoon season, we couldn't climb over the weather. We had to go around it. And, of course, several times it uh, got pretty hairy. Yeah. Uh, the weather wasn't too good. It was uh, uh, rainy and uh, the waves were quite high. They, they were high enough where they were coming up over the bow of the carrier. It wasn't uh, the ideal time to do it. But, uh, and they said go, so we had to go. One incident I remember uh, that the aircraft couldn't get home through the weather. It had to land at Broadway, which was the invasion uh, strip that we had, and they had to spend the night there and then fly back the next day. Yeah. We've had a couple of times here, some of our aircraft couldn't make it back and had to go to an alternate field somewhere.
the monsoon weather came in on us in April, April late, late part of April, and uh, on the 19th of May, our base was nothing but a mud hole, and we, it was just really bad weather, and the base was too out of condition to be an airport anymore, and we were sent back to Asansol, India, further inland, there again to a British airfield where we could recuperate and regroup. Sometimes we, we flew as many as, as two missions a day. It was virtually impossible to fly three uh, in, in daylight hours because uh, it was 250 miles to the Burma Valley from where we were. And uh, by the time you did that round trip and, and then some time over the target, uh, you were in for three, three and a half hours. And uh, when you got back, you had to get gas up and get uh, uh, reprovisioned with ammunition and so forth. And uh, by the time you did all that, it, two missions a day was, was the max you could, you could hope to do. As vital was the support it sustained, the hump was a bottleneck that occupied enormous resources to deliver a minimum lifeline of supplies. The Chinese and the allies who supported them were threatened with strangulation. British efforts to retake the Burma Road and push the Japanese back away from the vast resources of India were organized under British Colonel Ord Wingate. I, I came very close to being shot down on my first mission. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've, we've, uh, we flew to Rangoon we escorted a group of uh, B-24 heavy bombers, liberators, and uh, there were two squadrons, the 5th Fighter Squadron, which was both the other fighter squadron of the 1st Air Commando Group, and my, my squadron, which was the 6th Fighter Squadron, and uh, our job, the 6th Fighter Squadron's job, when we got to Rangoon was to go down, to the, go down on the deck and beat up the Japanese airfields. And uh, uh, so we went down and, and, uh, and st strafed the Japanese airfields. And uh, we made one pass and then pulled up through the, uh, there was a light cloud cover at about 1,500 feet. We pulled up through that and, and did a 180 and came back through it. Of course, there were, there were 20 airplanes, you know, and one behind the other. and. Since this was my first combat mission, I was the last man. And uh, when, we, when I broke out of the cover, uh, going down onto the Japanese airfield to strafe the second time, I heard a sound behind me that sounded like a Chinese fireworks. And uh, I knew that uh, I hadn't pulled the trigger to fire my guns, and uh, I knew that uh, it could only be one thing. It had, it had to be a, a Japanese airplane behind me. And I looked and there was a Japanese fighter very close behind me. First Air Commando also pioneered a number of military aviation firsts. These included the first invasion of enemy territory solely from the air, the first night heavy glider assault, the first use of the helicopter in combat, the first combat helicopter rescue, and the first use of air-to-ground rockets. All of these firsts, and many more, were conceived, planned, and achieved in only a few months of active combat. Uh, our president, uh, Roosevelt, was very adamant with Churchill that uh, he wanted colonialism ended, that uh, he wanted those countries freed. And we didn't know it at the time, but our group had, had been so successful, they wanted to bring them back and form new groups. And uh, that's why I think uh, the Special Operations Group took over. I can't say that, uh, that our operation had any political effect uh, pro-Archon. 
looking at looking at history uh, uh, Burma is a dictatorship uh, China is a is a communist country and uh, and India is now uh, three countries uh, what 65 years have passed and uh, a lot of things have taken place it was different it, I don't think it'll ever be duplicated again uh, there was no paperwork uh, everybody had a job to do uh, we were completely short of, of, of help we did everything ourselves uh, and uh, it was just an unusual experience. Tactics pioneered by the men of the 1st Air Commando Group would go on to be employed in the Korean conflict, the Vietnam War, and throughout the Cold War. Descendant units were active in those actions and all the way through the current military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. The U.S. Air Force's 1st Special Operations Wing, based at Herbert Field, Florida, continues the legacy of the 1st Air Commando Group's contributions to unconventional warfare.